<laughs> okay, let us start. Um, well, it's great to talk a little about Bitcoin since we haven't talked a lot about Bitcoin today. So welcome, Munit. Thank and you. Hi, hi everyone. Ex excited to be here. Yeah. Could you could you make just could you do a short intro about yourself and Blockstack or in the Trust Machines? What you do and what are you, what you're currently doing at Trust Machines and in the Blockstack? All right. So uh, Stacks is a uh, Bitcoin layer. The project started in 2017, and it's a very decentralized ecosystem. Right, so the the first sort of like mainnet launch happened in early 2021, and since then there are a bunch of different entities and players who are sort of like contributing to the code base and and building on top. So Trust Machines, like the company that um, that that I started, and I'm the CEO of, it's is one of such entities. And Trust Machine has a pretty broad mandate, right? Like we are we are uh, contributing to Stacks because we are interested in Bitcoin, mm -hmm. right? So think of that Bitcoin as the L1. And Stacks as a L2, just like Lightning is a L2 as well. And we'll get into some of the details and nuances of like what the L2 is or not. But that's the at the high level, I think Bitcoin is the largest asset. It's the most secure network. It's something like $500 billion of capital mostly just sitting there. And trying to unlock that capital, making it productive, uh, getting developers to build interesting applications on, on top of Bitcoin is, is really the mission. And, and I think that is how you grow the Bitcoin economy. That's how Bitcoin goes to a billion users because you have to make it programmable. You have to make it easy, fast, and cheap to send around and for developers to build all sorts of things on top of it. Okay, so what, what, really, in, uh, right, what really excites me is that the Bitcoin layer two systems has been blooming. And as you all know, it hasn't been a smooth year in the 2022 and 2023. So we have like different Bitcoin layer two systems like uh, non-smart contract layer two systems like uh, Lightning Network, but we also have, of course, Stacks, and we also have other uh, systems like LSK. So for the people who are curious about it, uh, could you just briefly explain which and what is this layer two systems and how they differentiate from each other? All right, so I think we'll, we'll do a little bit of a deep dive on this. This, this question <laughs> needs to be sliced up a little. And I think what I'll do is I'll first give people a little bit of the background on Bitcoin and uh, even like, you know, the pre-Ethereum era, right? Like why, why Bitcoin is the way it is, uh, you know, what, what's, what's going on in the industry in terms of the landscape and maybe tie in a little bit of my personal, personal history there as well, right? So personally, um, I think I'm a, I'm a very proud member of the Bitcoin class of 2013. It's been 10 years now, so this is the third uh, bear market that I'm seeing. And I think uh, it's, it's amazing to see how much this industry has grown, right? Like back in the day, uh, in 2013, when Bitcoin would go below $100, I would buy it. When it would go above 100, I would be like, it's too expensive. I'm not touching this thing and I'm, uh, I'm not going to buy, right? So it's a, I was a grad student at that time. Um, I was doing my PhD in Princeton in distributed systems. And I, I just got fascinated by Bitcoin. It's like a rabbit hole, started uh, building on top, uh, tinkering around with it, trying to do interesting things with the Bitcoin L1. And by the way, this is pre-Ethereum era, right? Ethereum didn't exist, not, not even on a, on a white paper. And I remember the early days of uh, Ethereum, the uh, white paper Vitalik wrote. I think I saw a draft before it actually, actually went public. And it was a very interesting debate happening at that time that can you have these Turing complete programming languages, yeah. right? And Bitcoin, Bitcoin on the other side has a very, very simple, Bitcoin relatively is a very simple protocol, right? It has a very, very simple programming language called the Bitcoin script. Think of that as if Bitcoin is almost like a calculator, right? There are very precise things you can do, like, you know, two plus two, two into four, things like that. It's like a calculator, uh, very simple. Whereas Ethereum is like a full blown computer. Right? You, can, you can program anything on top. And back in the day, there was a big debate that is this thing going to be secure? Is this the right way of building applications? And, and, and so on. And, and Bitcoin community actually looked very different. Right? So imagine Ethereum doesn't exist. All these other chains like Solana, Avalanche, they don't exist. So most of the innovation was also still happening on Bitcoin. You know, early days of NFTs, counterparty is how NFTs started. NFTs did not start on, on Ethereum, they started on Bitcoin. Uh, similarly, uh, people issuing assets. There was a protocol called Master, Mastercoin, 
uh, and colored coins and people were issuing those things. So all of those developers were initially uh, tinkering with and trying to build on Bitcoin. But Bitcoin, in a way, is severely limited in terms of what you can program on the L1, right? So you don't, you, it's like, it's like you're, you're working with very, very limited programming capabilities and also very limited scaling capabilities. And that's, that's the reason to build Ethereum in a way, right? Like, so Vitalik did that. And 2017 is the year I finished my PhD. And 2017 is the year when uh, Stacks, the project, started. And, and interestingly, Lightning started there as well, right? So Lightning people, in 2017, basically, there was a first wave of like, you know, new users coming in. Uh, Ethereum was basically starting to get used at that time. Uh, NFTs were starting on Ethereum, like very, very, very exciting time. And Bitcoin was hitting like scaling limitations, right? So Lightning as a project started basically to scale Bitcoin as payment rails, right? So Lightning is very, very simple. Lightning is mostly about uh, doing fast Bitcoin payments. So it's a L2, layer two, and you settle everything that you're doing back to the Bitcoin L1. Stacks is different, right? Stacks is basically a Ethereum-like, uh, fully programmable Bitcoin layer. Uh, and, and again, it settles back, back to Bitcoin uh, as well. But those, the, the, I think the difference between the two should, um, should be understood. And I, know, I, I don't know how technical the audience is, but I'll try to go a little bit technically deep because this difference is very important to understand. So the difference between the two things is that Bitcoin script, as I said, is a very sort of like constrained and simple programming language at the L1, uh -huh. Bitcoin L1. Lightning as a protocol is completely defined and contained by Bitcoin script. What that means is that Lightning is a quote unquote true L2. You're not, you're not trusting the Lightning network, right? When you move your Bitcoin into Lightning, uh, you can bring it back without trusting the Lightning network and the L Bitcoin L1 security is what guarantees the security of your money coming out of Lightning, which is a very great property to have, right? Now, if you look at Ethereum, so on, on, in, a, in, a, in the parallel world, you know, Ethereum is expanding and getting all these users, people are, Developers are coming to Ethereum, and then Ethereum is hitting scalability limitations, and people started building ETH L2s, uh, which are actually pretty mature now, right? So I think I saw Ed Felton walking around at some point. He, he's, uh, he, he was a professor at Princeton back then. And so we have Arbitrum, uh, we, we have uh, Starkware, we have Optimism, and these different uh, Ethereum L2s are there. So with Ethereum, because Ethereum L1 has the full programming capability, that means that these L2s are, in a way, relatively easier to build, right? And they're more trustless as well. So if you're looking at a optimism, uh, you don't have to trust the L2 that much. And we, I'm, I'm like staying at a high level, like we can get into how decentralized these things are and the sequencers and so on. But at a high level, you're only looking at Ethereum L1 security to get your assets out of the L2. On Bitcoin, Lightning is sort of like the only thing the only L2 where this is true, right? Because Lightning is very, very simple and is contained within the limited Bitcoin script. But that also means that Lightning doesn't have smart contracts. That you can't do much with Lightning other than payments, right? That's the flip side of it. Like it, it, it has to be very, very simple. So with Stacks, what we wanted to build is uh, we wanted to build something generic. Developers should be able to do whatever they, they want to do. Um, and, and that L2 looks different and that cannot be contained in Bitcoin script as as long as Bitcoin script uh, will have to change, right? And that doesn't happen. So in Bitcoin, it's very simple. Changes don't really happen, and they take multiple years, like two, three, four, or five years for even small changes to take place. But if you introduce new opcodes, so opcodes are like, as I said, Bitcoin is like a, like a calculator. So let's say Bitcoin knows how to do two plus two, but we want Bitcoin to do something else, like be able to verify that, you know, Bitcoin was taken out of L2 and came to L1, you'll have to, add that functionality to Bitcoin L1, which, which may happen down the road, but it's generally, I think it's like a five plus year type of a process, right? So that's the, that's the big difference. So with Stacks, uh, what we try to do is like get as close to Bitcoin security as possible. So there is a major release of Stacks that's happening early next year. And what that gets you is that Stacks will have 100% Bitcoin mining hash power security. Uh, we call that Bitcoin finality. What that basically means is that any transaction that you do on the L2, 
as it settles on, on the L1 to change that transaction, to reverse that transaction, someone will have to go and attack the Bitcoin L1 network, right? So the security budget sort of like the same. If I made, let's say, let's say I move my BTC from L1 to L2 on Stacks, I make a payment. As soon as that transaction confirms on the L1, uh, because it's settling, it basically has Bitcoin security. You can't go and then change that transaction. So what that does is people can actually do much cheaper transactions, much faster transactions on the L2, because on L2 you can get like five second confirmation times. And I think that would be a major UX boost for Bitcoin, because I think one of the, one of the bigger things is that you can't program Bitcoin, developers can't really sure. build interesting things, but also the UX is really bad. If you have to wait between 10 to 30 minutes for a Bitcoin confirmation, uh, some of the newer networks like Ethereum, Solana, and other things are much, much, much faster, right? So what we are trying to uh, unlock the beast that is Bitcoin uh, and trying to do that in a, as careful way as possible, and we'll get into some of the, some of the other details as well. Sounds interesting. Uh, so what I want to go back and just discuss a little bit before we move on is a lot of people say, like, you know, Bitcoin is just unprogrammable, you know, and ETH is completely programmable. Uh, but sometimes, for me, like, I get scared when sometimes I realize that if the future of money is completely programmable, that might be a little scary, oh, but it's also a beauty of it, right? It could change forever, but on the other side, it's kind of scary because it could change, right? So I, I just wanted to hear your thoughts about this because I think this is also one of the decision factors that made you to build on Bitcoin and other than any other blockchains. So could you share your thoughts about this and your decision process in this? Yes. So I do think this is one thing that really um, initially attracted me to Bitcoin and sort of like, you know, the reason I still, still believe in Bitcoin and, and work there. Basically, the Bitcoin base layer, the L1, is by design extremely simple, right? And, and when I say by design, I'll give you a little analogy. That when Satoshi wrote the code, uh, there, were, there were various op codes that, you know, he, she, they, whoever they were, implemented, but then disabled. So almost by intention, Satoshi wanted to do less at the L1 level, right? Let's just keep it very, very simple. Uh, because building decentralized money is hard enough, right? Like if you, if you really build something um, that, uh, that becomes decentralized money for the world, that's a very big problem. That's a very, very big thing to do. And I think Satoshi has done a great job. So interestingly, every time there has been a bull market since then, like 2017 was a bull market, 2021 was a bull market, a lot of people would come and come to stages like these, right? And be like, hey, you know, we have built something way better than Bitcoin. Bitcoin is going to go away. We're going to take over, yada, yada. Hasn't happened, right? Why? Because Bitcoin is reliable. It's durable. It's doing the job that it is meant to do, right? Where Bitcoin is lacking and majorly lacking is developers being able to do interesting things at L2s. So Bitcoin L2s aren't mature enough which is the problem that we are trying to solve. So the way I look at the industry is that there are basically three categories. One category is Ethereum, uh, all of the interesting things happening in Ethereum, and most of the recent uh, activity, both in terms of users and developers and capital, all the interest, is effectively going to Ethereum L2s. So Ethereum is something like you know, $250 billion in capital and 50 to $60 billion in Ethereum L2s. And, and most of the current work in Ethereum is basically going to the L2 projects like Arbitrum, Optimism, and, and, and Starkware, and, and so on. Right? So that's one world. You could take the view that Ethereum is where all the action is. I'm going to go, and I'm going to build on these Ethereum L2s. The second category is these alternate L1s, uh, which in 2021, we saw a bunch of these uh, take off, like Solana, Avalanche, uh, Algorand, all of these different L1s. And what they're saying is that, hey, forget about Bitcoin, forget about Ethereum. We have built like a better network, which is faster or whatever, whatever property you want to build, like some are more private and so on. So over there, I don't think that that, that, that category we saw, uh, especially in the last cycle that developers came in, they're building stuff, there are different trade-offs, and it's, it's exciting that those experiments are happening. Then there's a third category, which I think is the most underappreciated, and in my biased view, uh, the most high potential category out there, which is building in the Bitcoin ecosystem. Right, because Bitcoin still, after all of this development, you know, is the largest asset, 
500 billion dollars of capital just sitting there and Bitcoin L2s are basically worth something like one between one to two billion dollars. So if you look at the ratio, Ethereum is 250 billion dollars of capital and 60 billion dollar of ETH to L2 market. Bitcoin is double of that and the L2 market right now is between one to two billion. And I think Stacks is basically like 80% of it, right? We, we, we don't want to be that big of an L2. We, we would like to have more competition and more people building because I think competition would be really healthy uh, for the Bitcoin ecosystem and that's changing. So if we go back to the timeline I was talking about, so I categorize 2017 to 2022 as officially the dark ages of Bitcoin, right? That was probably the worst time to be a Bitcoiner, honestly. Uh, I, I won't go into the details, but basically there were these civil wars between the Bitcoin communities. A lot of the developers left. Uh, Bitcoin mainstream narrative was taken over by basically podcasters and, and, and bloggers and Twitter influencers. They aren't technical people, right? And they are, they, they are mostly clueless about, about technology, about building on things and so on. And they sort of like took over the Bitcoin narrative as Bitcoin is something that is just, um, just sort of like, you know, uh, a asset that you hold in cold storage and you don't do anything with it, right? And 2023, with the start of Ordinals, I don't know how many people are familiar here with Ordinals, but Ordinals are a revival of Bitcoin NFTs on Bitcoin L1. And I think that was the best thing that could have happened for, for Bitcoin, frankly, because it, it, it brought artists and creatives back to Bitcoin. It brought a lot of developers back to Bitcoin. It brought a lot of capital back to Bitcoin. And people just had this aha moment that, oh, wow, if I can have NFTs on Bitcoin, what else can we have? Can we have Bitcoin DeFi? Can we have Bitcoin-backed stable coins? Can we build all these lending protocols with Bitcoin? And, and now it clicks for people that, yes, I can, I can see this. Uh, sure, some of the dev tooling isn't there yet. Some of the L2s like Stacks and RSK and others, maybe they aren't as mature yet. But those are just engineering problems that can be solved, right? Like people like us are working on it. But, but people are now much more open to seeing Bitcoin as not just a passive asset that you hold in your cold storage, but something that where there's a thriving ecosystem like Ethereum or Solana and so on, where the asset that is being used is actually BTC. And I think that's a, that's a pretty, pretty large market that is currently underappreciated around the world. Yes, I, I do agree. And uh, I think it's like some people really like something that can change, adapt every time in the time. Some people like things that can't change. And there's beauty in both. Um, and recently, I was, I was really shocked and really interest, uh, felt interested by uh, the Tremor Ventures Bitcoin VC report, to be honest. Uh, and what I realized is, as you all know, 2022, 2023 has been a real tough year for the crypto market. But interestingly enough, while the crypto startup scenes, the number of startups, the number of fundraising rounds were dropping heavily, uh, what was interesting was in 2022, the Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin ecosystem related fundraising has nearly doubled. And uh, not to mention the number of developers and the amount of capital flowing in. Although it's, compared, well, it's relatively small compared to the other blockchains, but it was really, you know, something opposite was happening to the market condition. So uh, I, I just wanted to ask you, uh, as you are one of the leading figures in the Bitcoin ecosystem, what do you think is happening now in the Bitcoin ecosystem in the layer two fields, which you said is still immature, immature and what do you expect in the future? Yep, no, it's a, it's a great question. So I think I, I've noticed this trend uh, in previous cycles as well, when there's a bull market and then the bear market. When a bear market comes and some of the, like by the way, I'm a big supporter of the experimentation, right? Like go out, experiment, build things, do it responsibly, not, not do some of the crazy stuff that happened, but uh, we should experiment. But when these things blow up, people sort of like retrieve back to Bitcoin, right? Because Bitcoin was the durable thing that sort of like stayed there. You, you, you have never heard of a hack on the Bitcoin L1. No multi-sec wallet was hacked. Like not, nothing ever happened, right? Because that protocol is like so simple. So, and there is a ethos of like being very, very careful about how you're building. And, and, and that's the reason that a lot of institutional uh, uh, players are actually, Bitcoin is the only asset that they would uh, become comfortable with, 
right? If you're a large institution like a pension fund or, or a public company and you want to hold a crypto asset on your books, Bitcoin would be the first and maybe the only thing that, that, that you would become comfortable with, right? So Bitcoin, Bitcoin has that. But interestingly, I think even if you look at the architecture, uh, Vitalik wrote a very interesting blog post maybe six months ago where he's sort of like debating the design decisions in Bitcoin versus Ethereum. And it's a very thought-provoking uh, blog post because he, he, he effectively says that the Ethereum community has a decision to make because Ethereum is relatively more experimental, right? Like they make changes to ETH L1 much more frequently than Bitcoin L1. And in some ways you could argue that if all of the applications are going to run on L2s anyway, even in Ethereum, then why do you need complexity on L1? Like why can't ETH L1 be very, very simple like Bitcoin and be very hard to change, be very durable, and most of the apps are gonna run on the, on, on the L2s? And that's the question that even Vitalik was asking, right? Like, hey, why do we need this complexity and experimentation happening at the L1 on Ethereum? Should we be more like Bitcoin? Right? And I think there are analogies on the internet where protocols that were very simple at the base layer, like TCP IP, they're the ones that took off because people can always build complexity on top. There can always be an L2, there can always be an L3 on top, just like you have HTTP on top of TCP IP. And I think that's the way I see the Bitcoin network, that a lot of experimentation that's happening elsewhere, people would build those things on top of Bitcoin and maybe they will be more durable and more sustainable that way because the L1 is something that we can just trust that this is not gonna change. It's gonna remain the same and it will always be there for us. Right? So imagine why were people excited about the NFTs on Bitcoin? Because once you write your image as a NFT on the L1, you know that this might be there for decades to come. If Bitcoin goes away, the entire industry goes away. Right? So that's the sort of durability you, you, you get with Bitcoin. And I think that's what excites a lot of people. So basically at a high level, think of it this way, that every, every sort of like use case that you're seeing working in the industry right now, stable coins would be a big one, right? Like most stable coins are on Ethereum or, or Solana and other places right now. You can easily have stable coins on top of Bitcoin with these L2s. NFTs are already on the L1. If you're thinking about building lending protocols, imagine decentralized BTC lending, 500 a billion to a trillion dollars in capital, and people can program that on fast rails, and you can have these lending protocols and build other rails uh, uh, on top of it. Right, so that's the thing that excites me. I, I honestly look at a, a lot of the industry as, a, as experiments. You learn from them, and then you build those things on top of Bitcoin in a more mature way. Okay, it's very interesting, and I, I would love to continue this discussion, to be honest, but uh, we're, we're uh, like, oh, our timing isn't that long. So let's just move on to the next topic about stacks. So uh, for stacks, is really I think we should also discuss about clarity because it's very different from other blockchains, right? And besides, could you also add what you're looking for in stacks and the future development, like maybe SBTC or other developments you're planning for? Yep. So I think uh, with stacks, I would basically divide things into two. One is the existing version of Stacks. It went live in 2021. And I think it, it, it introduced a bunch of great things like the clarity language and this unique consensus mechanism. So basically Stacks as an L2 has this uh, interesting property that people who are participating in consensus, they get rewarded with BTC rewards, like actual Bitcoin on the L1. So uh, people who are early users, they uh, think, think of that as, as staking on Ethereum that when you stake ETH, you earn more ETH. On, on Stacks, when you lock up STX, you're actually earning BTC rewards, like on the L1. So you have a Bitcoin wallet. And the first time my friends actually used it, right? Like uh, they were sending me text messages late at night that, oh my God, I can't believe Bitcoin appeared in my wallet, right? Like because a lot of people, they really value BTC and they haven't seen Bitcoin programmable that way, that they're earning Bitcoin automatically from a protocol. Like how, how's that working? So, so the first version of Stacks basically had that core consensus mechanism and then the programming language clarity that we'll, we'll discuss uh, about. It had two major drawbacks, right? They're basically things that in hindsight maybe should have been built even sooner. The first is that Stacks settles all of the transactions on Bitcoin, right? So let's say there were a thousand transactions on, on Stacks. When a Bitcoin block comes, all of those thousand transactions will be settled, like written, uh, uh, consolidated on the L1. That's great for security, but it's really bad for speed, 
because, <laughs> because whenever a Bitcoin block comes, it's somewhere between 10 to 30 to sometimes 60 minutes. So I think this is right now probably the biggest weakness in Stacks right now, and you're hearing this from, from effectively the co-creator of the project, right? I, I fully admit that, that when users are sitting there and they're waiting for their transaction and it's been 20 minutes, that's not the UX that, that people expect, especially in this day and age, like when you, when you have like Solana, even Ethereum is like a couple of seconds uh, these days. So that's the biggest thing where uh, devs in the Stacks ecosystems, they're working on what we call fast blocks. They're very interesting. Fast blocks are effectively, we were able to have these, um, these verifiable proofs that in between two Bitcoin blocks, now you can have very reliable, let's call it every five second or something, blocks on stacks, right? So it doesn't matter if a Bitcoin block came after 10 minutes or 30 minutes or whatever, stacks L2 blocks will come reliably every five seconds and you can keep packaging more and more uh, transactions. And then when a Bitcoin block comes, everything settles on, on, on Bitcoin. When we started working on it, we actually realized that this is great for just normal Bitcoin transfers as well, right? Because, because with ordinals, what's happening is that the Bitcoin L1 fees started going up. Bitcoin fees did something like a 50x to 100x increase, depend, depending on how you, how you count it. And when Bitcoin L1 fees become very expensive, we have seen this story on Ethereum. People want to move their BTC to an L2 where it's cheaper. But now with the fast blocks, it's not just cheaper, it's actually much more faster and it's much more reliable. So if you're on an exchange, let's say you're sitting on Binance, uh, you can actually withdraw your BTC if, when, when, the, when the Stacks Nakamoto release goes live. You should be able to withdraw your Bitcoin from an exchange within five seconds on fast rails by paying like very little fee. And I think that basic UX is missing from Bitcoin. And once you get that on Bitcoin, people will be like, great, like why would I pay a higher fee and, and wait for 30 minutes when I can just do this like much, much faster in a more reliable way. So that's fast blocks. I think it's going to be a major, major thing once, once it goes live with the Nakamoto release. And the second big thing that we are, uh, we are working on is unlocking Bitcoin liquidity. So a L2 is only really meaningful if you can easily move your capital from the L1 uh, and back. Right, so Bitcoin, again, has something like $500 billion of capital, mostly just sitting there. People aren't doing much with that money, right? So we are working on uh, this very interesting way to deposit and withdraw BTC into the L2. And I, I can get into the technical details, but effectively, there is a decentralized group of signers where people who have locked up capital in the Stacks L2, they are the signers who are going to sign off on when you take your BTC out, right? And, and that's the thing where some people debate that, hey, does that make Stacks a real L2 or not? Because you can deposit BTC from L1 to L2 uh, trustlessly, right? No one can stop you. Uh, it will just go in. But on the way back, Bitcoin doesn't understand. It doesn't have the commands to understand that someone is trying to bring capital back, right? So that's where the decentralized group of signers comes in. And you're sort of like, you know, adding that trust assumption that these people are going to be honest, but they have capital lock. Even today, they have something like $300 million of capital locked. So it's like economic security, and this can grow over time uh, where, where people are effectively uh, bringing uh, BDC back to the L1. And that's, that's the place where if down the road, if Bitcoin can have some changes, it can have a few opcodes introduced, then we can even remove that. And at that time, here's the interesting part, there will be no difference between the Ethereum L2 or a Bitcoin L2, right? Like that, right now, that's the only difference because Bitcoin doesn't have those opcodes. But I think we can do that. Bitcoin does upgrade every two to three years or, or four years or something like that. So I think once, uh, once there's a ton of activity and usage and capital moving into the Stacks L2, there will be even more pressure on the Bitcoin L1 that it, why don't we just introduce these opcodes and, and make, make, make things even more secure. Really exciting news. I'm, I'm really looking forward to how the layer two ecosystems and Bitcoin will be matured or it will be developed in different ways. Uh, well, we've covered like the talks with Bitcoin, the layer twos and stacks, and I really would wish to continue this conversation on and on, but guess our time's up now. So we'll end this session now and thank you. This was Munib Ali from Trust Machines and this was BQ from Hashed. Thank you. Thanks everyone.